Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Natalie Runyon. Uh, I am the one of the uh, co-producers uh, of this webcast today, and I am the content strategist for the Thomson Reuters uh, Next Gen Leadership Advancing Lawyers of Color Initiative. And we are really excited about our ongoing partnership with the ABA Young Lawyers Division Men of Color Project, and specifically about the topic today. Um, to give you a couple, to cover off a couple of housekeeping items, if you have questions at any time, you have a Q&A widget where you could submit questions and uh, you can submit them throughout the webcast today. Um, we're going to wait until about the last 15 or 20 minutes before we get to those questions, but just know that you can submit them at any time. Also, please know that uh, the session is being recorded today. Um, and so now I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, uh, Michael Wynn, who is the uh, national co-director for the ABA Young Lawyers Division Men of Color Project. So Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Vulnerability as a Leadership Strength uh, during, times of, during Tumultuous Times. Uh, this program is a collaborative effort between the ABA Young Lawyers Division Men of Color Project and uh, Thomson Reuters Next Gen Leadership Advancing Lawyers of Color. My name again is Michael Nguyen. Um, I currently co-chair the Men of Color Project and uh, I formerly worked as a prosecutor in the Bay Area. Um, again, we are really excited to kickstart the Young Lawyer Division's first ever virtual conference, uh, which starts today and to discuss a topic that's um, extremely important, especially during these times um, where there's just a lot of chaos and uh, you know a lot of uncertainty. Um, but before we launch into this discussion, you know I'd be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the current climate um, in America. You know, not only did COVID basically upend you know life as we knew it, and everything changed so quickly. You know, in the last few weeks with the murder of George Floyd, you know, there's wide, widespread protests across the country um, against racial injustice and police, police brutality. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hurt right now. There's a lot of frustration um, and anger. And now is the time to um, to listen and to educate ourselves and to show compassion. You know, now more than ever, leaders really need to um, embrace vulnerability as a leadership strength. Um, which turns me to our uh, topic of discussion here. So I'd like to um, introduce to you the uh, panelists for this webinar. Um, maybe each of you can go around and uh, briefly introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Donovan Bonner. I'm an attorney at Coblins Patch, Duffy & Bass, LLP in San Francisco, and also a WildD scholar this year. Um, I practice in around employment law. Thanks for coming. Hi, my name is Adrienette Williams. I'm the managing attorney for the region of, uh, of Conflict Council out of Hillsborough County in Tampa, Florida. I am also the former assistant director of the Henry Latimer Center for Professionalism at the Florida Bar, and I am the proud owner of a consulting firm where I do speaking and coaching. Hello, everyone. My name is LJ Chavis, and I'm a rising 2L at the Southern University Law Center. I'm located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm glad to be here today. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I like to start off with, um, you know, this, this famous quote that everyone's familiar with, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, Adriana, what does this quote mean to you, and how does it fit into your understanding of, of leadership? Uh, that's one of the quotes that I always uh, think about and use, and I've, I've um, heard growing up in church, that's one of our things that we live by. And what it basically means is if you do not have a relationship with someone, if you don't know them, it's really hard to correct them. It's really hard to lead your people if you don't know them. And along with that, uh, I always say that love without truth is hypocrisy, but truth without love is brutality. And when you talk about love, I'm talking about that agape, like holistic. So as you lead people, you have to have a heart for people. And so when I hear 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care is talking about that personal connection of checking in with your people, knowing them so that you can lead and serve them. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that. I think we've all been a part of, you know, one sided conversations where someone is doing all the talking, talking about themselves, but not really asking about you or how you feel or what you have to add to the conversation. But I think it's time that we stop and we listen and we ask, you know, before we want to give our, you know, thoughts about our own self, we ask about someone else. We ask about what they're going through in their life or what they need or how they can be a better person. So I think it's a time for us to stop worrying about you know so much about us and worry about you know the person beyond you it's a pivotal part of being a leader in pouring into the people that's around you oh yeah i agree i believe that as it relates to the law school level in terms of just being having classmates all you guys went to law school you know how competitive and how stressful it is at times and everyone's competing for the A or the B and, and just to have a person who just wants to know like how you're doing today instead of, you know, you have the answers to this question. It, it really brings a human element to law school. It brings a human element to you making a choice to even go through that drastic life change. Um, so I believe that that helps leadership as well. Right. So, so I think you guys are kind of touching on sort of this concept of being vulnerable, right? Um, you know, Donovan, what, what does that mean to you to be vulnerable and, and why is that such an important concept when it comes to leadership? Uh, being vulnerable, vulnerable is being, you know, not afraid to show your feelings, being okay with being in an uncomfortable situation. Um, it's being okay learning or knowing that you're not, you don't know everything. It's being able to, you know, ask questions or be put in a situations that, you know, might necessarily not feel right at the moment, uh, it's kind of stepping out of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of us see vulnerability as weakness, but it's actually strength because that's when you start to learn how you can be better as a person or how you can contribute more to society. Uh, vulnerability, you know, is a step to greatness and learning from the people around you. Right, and how does this how does this concept play into um, you know either your personal life or in the work setting? How do you um, show vulnerability and how does that um, how does that play out? I mean, I think just in this day and age and in this time, there is a lot uh, going on in the world. Uh, me personally, during COVID, I moved jobs and I moved states. And then also on top of this, we are seeing consistent racial inequality and police brutality. And it gives this, you know, out of control feeling. And you try to feel like how you, what can you do uh, to help your situation? So in wakes of COVID, you figure out, figure out how to work from home, how to connect with your peers, you know, reaching out to friends, trying to, you know, connect in some kind of way um, and expressing your feelings. You know, we're all dealing, you know, with COVID in a lot of different ways. Some people have kids, you know, some people living with their parents. Um, so we're just all adapting, you know, and in different ways and being vulnerable is talking about those feelings or talking about how you can cope with your uh, situation uh, just a little bit better. And some similar when it comes to racial equality and police brutality, you know, it's a little bit out of control. You try to figure out what you can control in that process, which, is really, really difficult. Uh, you know, it's coming from a place of anger. I'm exhausted. I'm annoyed, you know, tired of this situation happening. You know, I can control so much being remote in my house. But when I step outside, how do I control and add to the situation and giving to the world? So it's a little hard to figure all of that out. But there's some things, you know, you can do when a storm's coming. You know, there's some ways that you can prepare for it, but not prevent it. So you try to figure out the ways that you can add or you know add a little bit more maybe to your workplace or have tough conversations with your friends in order to build on the things that you can't necessarily control in the outside world mm -hmm. right Adrian, what do you think about that i think he's right on the money and when we talk about being vulnerable uh i say being vulnerable is it doesn't mean you're strong just like you said it means uh peeling back those layers that we kind of put on for the world. And especially as attorneys, we solve everybody else's problems. We're supposed to be the heroes. We're supposed to have the answers. And sometimes we don't have the answers. And I've learned that that's okay too. So it's taking off that layer. And then it's also taking off that layer of just 
not worrying about what other people think about you and also having those tough conversations because i think all of us probably have experience in the wake of COVID 19 and the the recent murders of, of black individuals a sense of hopelessness and um i i've literally had to have some tough conversations even with the leadership in my job so i'm grateful for my leaders for actually having a, a platform where we feel comfortable discussing these things and then how we can take those uh the things that we talk about and apply them to our team so that we we're not just acting like this didn't happen because I, I told them we can't act like this didn't happen. The riots are literally outside our window right now. Like we see the people marching. We can't sit here and act like it's not happening. So how are we going to address it? Um, and the last part of being vulnerable is just, uh, let's see. I think just like I said, yeah, having the tough conversations, peeling back the layers and um, asking for help. I think that's part of being leadership too. Cause I came to a new position. I don't know everything. And so it's people on my team who've been there for years and years. And I say, hey, I'm going to depend on you for this if that's okay. And I think that's also part of uh, being vulnerable as a leader, admitting what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So you talked about um, having sort of tough conversations at work and especially with everything that's going on right now. Um, I, I think when we talk about vulnerability, it's it's being authentic right being yourself and bringing your most authentic self to work that means being able to share your your core beliefs and your values right um but what if but what if those at um at work don't embrace those values right how do you have i mean how do you even approach that how do you bring it up and be vulnerable and what is the effect of that well, I will admit, every work <laughs> environment is not going to be welcoming to this type of topic. And that's when you have to have a, a group of people, and I call, it, I call it my board of directors for life. And these are the people who I talk to about these kind of things. And these may be my mentors. These may be my parents. It may be my pastor. It may be someone who's a spiritual leader or some of my colleagues. But you have to have a group of people uh, around you who can uplift you, especially in our field, who you can reach out to if you have some sort of issues going on. Because I do have colleagues who don't have the luxury of being able to speak, you know, like I do candidly. And I'm... I'm this is not new to me. I've been having these tough conversations for years. And so I'm the girl who everybody swept to the, to the back of the room and now this is suddenly popular. But um, sometimes it's not popular to have these conversations and everybody does not have the lifestyle luxury of being able to speak that because they need their jobs. And so outside of that, you have to have a core, a core of people that you can discuss this with and even counseling if needed. And I think that's part of what we need to understand is that if you need help, if you are stressed, if you do have some sort of heavy weight on you, reach out and get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah think, I agree. I think it, Go ahead. I, mean, um, I was just going to mention that, you know, I agree. Like, you're definitely, you know, I want to clash personalities with people as you come across them. And that's okay. Like, you're not supposed to get along with everyone. Um, but, but um, you know, um, I think it's important, like, uh, you know, to have that core group of people who – who know you and to know your personality, to know what you mean, you know, uh, when you roll your eyes in a certain situation, they know what you mean when you pop your lips in a certain situation, you know, they know your movements, they know how you respond to certain situations. And I think that's a part of being like a human element. Also, like being vulnerable, you're able to be you instead of putting on this uh, act, you know, as most people do in certain situations. Exactly. I think there's tough conversations that have to be had. And obviously, we're all in very different job and financial situations. But if your workplace isn't reflecting necessarily the values that, you know, are within you, then you maybe it's time to, you know, recalculate and think, you know, where you might want to put your energy or, you know, restart your career or do more. Um, I know it became an issue with, you know, some of my friends. Uh, a lot of companies are putting out statements or, you know, internally or externally about how they felt about all the racial inequality or the deaths that's happened. But some of my friends, there was no statements. It was silence. And they didn't really know how to react. And they were trying to figure out whether they should step up and say something, right? But you don't want to be the one to kind of poke the bear or, you know, kind of cause a ripple effect. Uh, but sometimes you need to be. There's obviously there's ways that you could approach it um, and there's ways that you can handle the situation. But sometimes you you can be vulnerable and, you know, slightly disruptive to start the conversation. You know, it could go a lot farther than maybe you think it would. 
Right, right. And and when you do that, when you are um, sort of sharing, you're being vulnerable and you're sharing your authentic self, um, what are the effects of that? Has it been positive for you guys in, in the workplace, positive or negative, either way? I think, yes, um, I, uh, I mean, for me, uh, when I'm able to just um, be me, it's been very positive. Um, people tend to, you know, like when I'm my normal self. I, mean, I like when I'm my normal self. I like when I'm me. When I meet, so I feel like you know, I've had a very positive experience being me, and I haven't put on the act. Mm-hmm. Somebody else was going to jump in. Yeah, um, I haven't always had the most positive experience uh, in different work uh, areas, being my authentic self. But I think that is something that we really don't talk about. And Donovan hit it head on. Uh, sometimes what I've learned is that if you're clashing with the the company or the values of the company. Um, sometimes, especially if you're if you're young, you're just starting your career. Uh, it's not worth the effort of continuing to fight every day, where you can channel that energy to go where you're celebrated and just not tolerated. I think it's something that we don't talk about enough, and that it's okay to leave a toxic work environment because that is toxic if you. Are, are shut down if you can't speak your truth or you can't have a diplomatic conversation without, you know, have a asterisk by your name or being ostracized. Um, so I think that's something we don't talk about enough. But yeah, sometimes you got to be willing to make a career move. And I have made career moves. I have taken uh, cuts in my pay. I've moved to different cities and I would do it all over again just to have a job where I'm happy. And I think that's been the, some of the best decisions I've made. Mm. You know, uh, Donovan, you talked earlier about, you know, seeing sort of certain certain companies now coming out with statements um, about what's going on. So what do you think is the best way to address silence within an organization um, about, you know, the expanding movement of racial justice? I mean, it kind of comes from the top bottom, but I think, you know, if it's an uncomfortable situation, then you just talk to right your close peers. You you try to create a close group within the company that, you know, maybe aligns with, you know, the things that you're thinking. Uh, But it's also as, you know, a black man, I would want my company to support the person that I am. So I'm going to try to talk to HR or whoever I know facilitates, you know, certain things at the company to see if they stand by me, because I want them, you know, to take action on on my part. Like, I'm very blessed. I didn't have to tell my job to come out with a statement. And, you know, sometimes it's also, you know, does your job go to the one, you know, black person in the room, you know, and sometimes you can be pointed out like that. For me personally, I'd rather have that. I'd rather you come talk to me about the situation. Uh, but it's it's uncomfortable, you know, it's just, this is an uncomfortable space for everyone to try to operate in. Uh, but it is a time to kind of stand out. I think this current climate that we're in, uh, a lot more people are ready to listen than I've ever seen before in my own lifetime. Uh, so I think this is a time where we can, you know, step in and make a lot of movements to move forward. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, you know, I just, I just think about when we, when we talk about uh, being authentic, you know, at work and, and um, you know, the, the, the positive effect of being vulnerable, you know, I think about, you know, when I worked as a prosecutor, a lot of times we, um, in interviewing witnesses and, and victims, right, in preparation for trial, when we meet with a victim or a witness, um, you know, I don't just right away go into the facts of the case right or i don't i don't review the report with them right away it's important to ask them you know how how they're doing right and getting to know them and i think that process of of building a rapport with the witness and the victim goes a long way because then they it's all about establishing a rapport and a connection right and and going back to that quote like if they know that you care about them as a person right that in turn is going to help that person do better you know you know as a witness um so, so I just had some thoughts about about that. Um, question for you guys. So, wh- how do you transition from acknowledging that um, that a part of your life is is out of control? And definitely, right now, with everything that's happening with COVID, um, how do you reframe your mindset to go from negative to positive? I mean, are you even doing that, or, or is it? I know it's easy just to dwell in like a, a lot of negativity right now, but how are you guys reframing that mindset? 
I know with me, um, I guess um, most of my, uh, personally, uh, most of my training of, of being able to control my mindset has been for me being an athlete, and, and, and I've played sports my whole life, so you, you know, you get, you, you know, a knockdown, but you stand up again, and, and you dust yourself while we keep moving, so a lot of, you know, a lot of my, um, I tend to, whenever I go through certain situations in life, I try to always relate it to sports or like when, you know, when I played this game and we lost or when I played in this game and we started off losing, but we won. So it's more like with me, it would be more of an athlete's mentality of how I go about life. If that makes you know, any sense. Um, but that's how I get through some situations. Mm. I think for me, I kind of separate the two situations when it comes to COVID and when it comes to all the racial injustice. Uh, with COVID, it's a little bit, Okay, more okay for me to balance and be more positive about it. A lot of people are going through this, you know, I still have a job, like I'm able to like, cope in different ways and being around family, that type of thing. Uh, but when it comes to the racial injustice, uh, I'm still in the middle of figuring out how to cope with it and how to have a positive attitude. Uh, Cause I'm pretty still, I'm still angry at this moment, but I mean, what I try to focus on what I think will get me through is literally a hope for a better tomorrow. Um, I know more of my friends have hit me up and interacted with me than ever. And that gives me hope that there is change for the future. You know, there's, as I said, I have to be more vulnerable and talk about my feelings and frustrations, uh, what are uh, what is going on in my life. But it is still a common, you know, a place that I'm in right now that it is kind of hard to see the light on the other side because it's something that I've been dealing with my entire life. So as I as I I'm still going through the same thing I was going through, you know, as I came into this world. So it's kind of like, how do I be resilient and keep moving forward when it's always something that I had to deal with? So I think it's hard to kind of jump over the hurdle and be positive, but you know, certain aspects in your circle and like I said, you know, I think the world is changing and more people are willing to listen now. That gives me the slightest bit of bit of hope that you know this may change for the better. Mm -hmm. I can agree. And I, first of all, thank you for just being honest about, yeah, I'm angry and I'm still there. And, and that's exactly what I was going to say is I don't necessarily try to move through the negativity so quickly. I sit in it for a minute because it's important to honor your feelings and you don't always have to be happy. You don't always have to be okay. And it's okay not to be okay. And so uh, I think that's part of moving forward is not just because I think also as a woman of color, you know, you're it's just saying, oh, you're such a strong black woman. I don't have to be strong all the time. You know, um, sometimes I do have weak moments and sometimes things do bother me. So I sit in that for a minute and I honor what I'm feeling. And then I get up and I think about what I can do to fix it. Or if it's something I can fix, I do. If it's something I cannot fix, I realize I try to figure out how to work around it. But I sit in it for a minute. Mm. You know, Donovan, you brought up, um, you know, re resiliency. You know, how does resiliency fit into the growth mindset? Um, I mean, it's resiliency is amazing. I mean, that's being able to withstand, you know, or overcome something, you know, quickly or through a, through a period, you know, try to get through these difficult situations. But it's, it's also tough. Uh, it sometimes calls you to be strong when you don't really even want to be strong or where you're trying to find the effort to be strong. Uh, so it's kind of like, how long will I always have to cope you know, with these racial situations? How long will it have to be? But, you know, pushing forward is the resiliency that I know I'll always have to fight. The only, I only have a choice to fight. Uh, there's no way that I could give up. So that how that's how I see as being resilient is that I'm I'm moving forward. I could be more vocal about the change that I want to see, you know, it's, and it's not important to focus on, you know, how we continue to be knocked down through the adversities of life, but how I could come back stronger and how I can, you know, affect the world. So the resiliency is kind of focused, trying to focus on that and keep pushing forward, even though you might be, you know, in a time of turmoil. Yeah. And, and LJ, I mean, resiliency for you right now is extremely important, right? Being a, you're, you're entering your second year of law school. And I don't know if you're going back to your schools, having students going back to campus in the fall, but there's a lot of uncertainty for you in terms of your summer internship and, and, and uh, what's ahead. So how does that, how, how are you incorporating resiliency into your framework right now? Um, you know, I just think taking things a step at a time, a day at a time, um, helps that process because like this is such a new process. Like literally 
my life changed when I moved from Washington to see the Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to go to law school. And then it changed in the spring semester when we had to do law school from home. So I really think just uh, making it through, pushing through and taking things a day at a time helps me get through, um, uh, uh, you know, this you know, time we're in. And also, as I said earlier, just having people to talk to, you know, having an outlet of people who are not in law school, um, who are not lawyers, you know, um, you know, just talk to him and get through the situation. Mm -hmm. And Adrian Ed, how about you? I have a motto I live by because I, you know, I play basketball too. One of the things is you can't do anything until you show up. And so a lot of times I just tell myself, you know what, I just got to show up today. Uh, and you know, once you show up, the greatness is going to take over. So sometimes my mindset is just keep showing up. Uh, and I think that's resiliency in itself. Just keep going back for more. People say, oh, she's back for more. He's back for more. Yes. And if you keep showing up, that's the first step to actually being great. You got to be there. And um, also with everything going on in the world, we want to do so much. But what I've learned is operate in your gift, like use your gift to make changes. You may not be able to march on the front lines or you may not be able to do what everybody else does. But if we use what we have, our special gifts, and mine is speaking out, I've been speaking out forever. I've been training, I've been teaching. And so I decided I'm gonna continue to do that because that is the way I can contribute best to the world. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I think with growth, with the growth mindset, um, a lot of times people believe, think that, you know, just, um, you know, through hard work and dedication that, you know, have basically having talent in the brains is like enough, right? But that's oftentimes that's not enough. You have to be resilient and um, you have to show vulnerability, right? Um, I think we talked a bit about this earlier, but, um, you know, being vulnerable uh, with your friends or coworkers um, is not really easy, right? So how do you sort of let that guard down? Like, how do you approach that? Oh, that's definitely a process, I believe. That's that's uh, something that happens over time. You just don't, um, you know, uh, let that wall down easily. So I, I feel like the more comfortable you are with that person, the more time you spend with them, the more they get to know you, the more you get to know them, the more you get guys get to go through things together and grow together. Um, I feel like that helps you in, in being able to, to be vulnerable with the person. It's like anything else, like in sports or like in a relationship, it's just like the more you go through, the more you learn about each other, the more vulnerable you can be with each other. Absolutely. And I think it goes back, you know, to the quote that we started with, caring. Like, if I feel you care about me, that's much more easier that I could tell you about something that I'm really feeling. And if I, you know, give off my emotions where you know that I care about you, your feelings, although I might not agree with everything, if I care to hear and listen and know your thought process and we can have a, you know, facilitated discussion and talk about it, then, you know, that opens up the door for letting the guard down because, you know, each party is willing to, you know, engage. Although they might not agree on everything, you can engage and you can learn from each other. So I think it kind of starts there. Is your net? Um, can you repeat the question one more time for me? So how do you, basically, how do you gain the confidence to show, to let your guard down and, and show your vulnerability? Because that's not an easy thing to do, right? No, it's not. And I think they hit on it um, is, uh, number one, uh, everybody doesn't deserve your authentic self. I, I hate to say that, but everybody does not deserve the best of you. Uh, you can give them, uh, you know, you can be cordial, but everybody doesn't deserve your deepest thoughts. Um, so I think that time does help with that. But also um, when I talk to people, I've literally like had such a much better life because I stopped taking stuff personally. Like when people are mean or when they're rude, you know, when I deal with judges who are cantankerous and I deal with opposing counsel who's just like rude, I don't take it personally anymore. The first thing I say is, you know, hey, are you okay? And I have, uh, as we were building for this, I, I asked one of my uh, colleagues uh, who works for the state, I'm a defense attorney. And he says, no, I'm not okay. The fifth anniversary of my daughter's death is this weekend. So I'm not okay right now, but thank you for asking. 
and that literally has changed the trajectory of the relationship that we have because he is so hard to deal with for everybody else. And everybody says, well, Adrian, how do you get him to do this? And I, because we built that personal relationship. So if you are going to be authentic, you kind of got to have a thick skin and you can't take things personally if you do let down your guard. You got to understand that's just them and you can't take it personally as, a, as it's a reflection on you. Right. Um, actually, there's there's a really good question that, that uh, just came in from one of the audience members. Um, so let me read this to you guys. Uh, do you ever f do you ever get drained or feel overly magnified, put under the microscope, especially at uh, especially at work right now, right now that police brutality is in the spotlight? For example, um, this person has had so many people ask him or her, uh, ask them if they're okay. Um, I know they meant well, but what we're seeing now isn't new. But the questions are. I mean, I think also, it just depends on how you how you kind of look at it and receive the information if it's certain people from work that you know you have a common rapport with and they're reaching out to you then it's not really a big deal right but if it's new people then you get put on the spotlight and you're like i'm the only person of color here or i'm one of the few people of color here and they want to you know ask me how i'm doing and i don't really want to talk about how i'm doing right now uh, i think it's i think it's just a really difficult situation uh, me personally at my work I uh, kind of hopped on the DNI committee really quickly, and I know they wanted me to talk, and there's only a few of us, uh, but I kind of put it on myself that I need to say something. Like, it's because you know, I, this is my platform. This is, I, if I wanted them to get it right, I feel like I have to have a voice in the situation. But it is kind of hard being on the spotlight because, you know, you're already dealing with your own emotions and how you cope with the situation personally. And then you have this whole other, you know, group that's, trying to figure out how they deal with their own feelings and they're kind of using you as a resource. So it's, I don't know, it's unfortunate, but it's also in a way, it's better to be seen than not, uh, you know, not seen at all in a way. So I think if they're asking you questions, obviously there's a way that they should approach the situation, but sometimes that's better. I know, like I said earlier, I've been dealing with this my entire life. And now people finally are acting like they care or maybe they really do, but almost that's better, you know, for the future and for a change moving forward. Mm -hmm. So, oh, go ahead, Adrian. I was gonna say, I, I think uh, just like you say, we, you, you hope it's authentic, and I think that's what Donovan is, Donovan is saying. Like, we, what I hope is that this is authentic because if it is, it's an amazing opportunity to move forward. But I think we all have that little like, what if everybody's just doing it because it's popular? What if everybody's just doing it because it's lucrative? Or now it's the new hot, hot thing to talk about? Um, and so that's part of the hope too. Um, Sometimes I, I was always resistant to being the person who, well, I remember in school, I was a business major. I was the only black person. The teacher said, how do you feel about affirmative action? And I remember feeling just so like, why would he ask me out of all the people I was embarrassed? But what I've learned is that, um, number one, people who are allies, who are not black, who want to help this cause, do your research, you know, learn, read. And, and and then come with questions after that. And I think that's part of it too, is you have to educate yourself uh, because every person of color is not gonna be a champion and be able to, just like Donovan said, they may not have the, the bandwidth at that time to really champion for the cause. And then the other part of that is I realize that if I want other people to champion for the cause of equality and diversity, I can't sit back on the bench and expect other people who don't look like me to fight and advocate harder for me than I advocate for myself. So that was kind of my wake up call to being like, okay, I'm gonna get a seat at the table when I get there. I'm not gonna look around and wonder if I'm, why I'm here or whatever, but while I'm here, I'm gonna do the work and uh, champion for what I feel like is the right and ethical and professional things. And to add on to that, you know, it's really hard to be the person, I'm gonna be honest, you know, it's really hard to be the person where people come to you to get validated, you know, about how they should feel about something. Like, I go to a historic black law school, but we do have white students there. And at times it is kind of annoying when they ask you, oh, how do you feel about this? Or how do you feel about that? Or, or like, you know, how can I help? How should I feel? I mean, you feel how you feel. You act how you want to act, you know? But, uh, you know, it's, I understand at times it can be annoying and it, can be rough, you know, being the person on the spotlight. So, 
Right. I mean, I so, totally like what Adrianette said about uh, just getting educated first. I think there's plenty of times where we just try to go out and start asking questions and we think we know how someone feels and, you know, it's questions, 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 you know, before we even, you know, take a step back and really learn about the situation. Uh, and me personally, at my job, we talked about doing an implicit bias training. And I wanted to have that training before we do any kind of open forum session, before we do anything, because I think sometimes people, you know, react or have something to say back, maybe to my experiences, when you think you know how I feel, but you don't. So I think if you put in the work sometimes before, you know, it'll create the relationship. And also, I know that, you know, this isn't a joke to you anymore. This isn't just, you know, a question that you checked off the list. Like I asked Donovan a question, we're good now. You know, I got my points. No, I need to see you put the work in and you show that you really care. This is not a one-time thing. This is not something that we need to forget about, you know, in a month and move on in our lives. This is something that we need to constantly, you know, continue to build moving forward. Right, right. I mean, that's spot on. I think I think taking the time to educate yourself um, is really important and showing that. It's a way of showing that you want to learn and, and you care, right? Um, but have you guys been in situations where, you know, there's a lot of people there that aren't educated about this, right? And um, they do, in their own way, want to show that they care. But like Donovan, like you said earlier, sometimes like just putting out a statement, um, isn't really genuine, right? And so have you guys encountered whether, um, you know, in your, through your friends or at work where people are trying to reach out and, and show that they care, but they don't come across as genuine? So how do you guys respond to that? Um, I think it's, it's, it's tough. I think you respond to the person the best way you can. That's the only way you can, you know, kind of control the situation. But if someone isn't being genuine towards me, I kind of move on. It is, it's just not something I'll continually engage. I try to work around them. I try to make influence around them. And maybe I'll, you know, you know, hit them another way and it can work out another way. But I need, I need you to be come from a place of you know, humbleness and, you know, be willing to listen and understand before I can really pour into you. You know, I, like I said, I want to be vulnerable when I know you really care. So until we kind of get there, you know, I don't want to come at you as an angry black person and, you know, you're not understanding what I'm saying and try to force you to get the understanding, you know, what I mean. I, I need you to already come from a place that, you know, you're willing to talk about, you're willing to understand and that you actually care and, you know, you're willing to learn about the situation. I always ask the question. I always say, uh, when people say, well, how do you feel about that? Or what do you think? I said, do you really want my answer? Or even when I know <laughs> Seriously, I asked, do you really want my, do you really want to talk about this? Or are you just asking me? And this is your chance to back out because we're going to have a real conversation. And, and seriously, that's how I ended up in my new position is because at my old position, I was speaking at the Florida bar. And when I got there, they wanted to change the agenda and they wanted me to talk about my experience as a black attorney. And I said, well, that's different than talking about diversity. Now you're asking about my personal experience, and this is different. Are you sure you want to hear what I have to say in this room full of people who don't look like me? And they said, yes, yes, speak your truth. I said, are you sure? Okay. And so I really talked to them, and one of the things we talked about was you need to be authentic if you're going to come to this table and we're going to have this discussion. Then you need to speak for people when they're not in the room who deserve it. That's sponsorship. I call that aligning yourself with people who deserve the opportunity. So you have to be authentic. You have to align yourself. And then you need to advocate for those individuals. And those are the three things I talk to people about when, when you are interested in really helping the cause. Come to the table and really let's have an open conversation. Because if you ask me that question about my personal experience as a, as a, a black woman and the practice of law of life, that's a totally different topic than just talking about diversity. And so I try to make sure that when they have that conversation, they're ready. Yeah, well, it, it seems, Adrianette, that you are not afraid to have that conversation and you're willing to speak up at work, right? And be authentic and, and, and share yourself, right? But has, to any of you guys there, to any, uh, any of you on the panel, have there been any situations where, um, you know, the failure to show vulnerability um, or to look strong, like backfired on you. Has that happened at all or? 
Uh, yeah. For me, I don't think so. Pers pers personally, in my work settings, uh, I've mean, been blessed to work at some amazing places. I mean, I haven't necessarily put on, been put on a pedestal at all these places, uh, but me not showing vulnerability hasn't quite you know, affected me in the workplace. I've dealt with it in a lot of places outside of the workplace, uh, but in the workplace, I haven't been too affected. It has affected me, but in those situations we just talked about, you recognize, you know, I, I, I think it's, I, I like it because then you get to see the person for who they are and they're revealing themselves. And just like we talked about before, that may not be the environment for me long term, so I may need to start thinking about my next step. And you, if, you know, if you can be delivered from evil, don't keep in touch. I agree. Um, it, it just, you know, um, it is really um, depends. Like I haven't really had any experience in that you know realm, but I mean, I've been around people who have. It just really depends on how they respond to it. Mm. Okay, and um, I think that's just part of this part of it. You you're not gonna everybody's not gonna receive you well, and that, you gotta accept that part too. Mm -hmm. um, so we had another good question from the audience, um, and somebody asked. How do you balance the need to be an expert on a legal matter in front of the client and be vulnerable enough uh, internally to admit that you don't know everything? I'll let the lawyers handle this one. Uh, I just think it's just, there's no way you're gonna know everything, right? I think we're we're knowledgeable to the point that, you know, we can carry on a conversation, but it's okay to be like, I can, I, I'll get back to you, you know? I can't quite answer this question right now. Um, but, you know, you kind of, you know, you figure out a way to give them an answer you know, enough to where they can deal with it now, but I think it's better to put yourself in a position where it's like, I can get back to you. I'll just look into this, you know, a little bit more um, and just kind of put the conversation at pause there. You know, you don't want to jump into the, you know, the malpractice or like, you know, jumping out of your comfort zone and saying too much. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's a balance there to just be like, I don't know. I mean, a lot of clients expect you to know everything and why are you billing me for so much and all of this, uh, but we don't know everything. We can't keep everything in our heads. So I think it's okay to say, you know, kind of got, have to go back to the drawing board and try to understand this a little bit more so you can you know flesh out the complete strategy for them i agree i just say i don't know and let me uh find that out for you and i and i make sure that i give them the deadline i get back with them with a thoughtful and, and full response most of my clients appreciate it i don't really have an issue with saying i don't know something right um so somebody asked um asked me actually earlier about when I talked about building rapport uh, with um, witnesses or victims in a case. Um, and how do you do that when your time is limited, uh, when you're limited to one hour scheduled Zoom meetings and, there are, and those limited times have a full agenda? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think even, even with an hour, there's still enough time to like check in with people, right? Um, and to see how they're how they're doing. Um, it's 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 just simple questions that you can ask, right? Like, how's your day? You know, like how do you how do you feel about being involved in this case? You know, gives them a chance to really uh, tell you how they feel. It gives them a chance to be authentic, right, about their their feelings and their involvement in the case. Um, and overall, like it, it just it just helps. Um, what about you guys? What do you think? I mean, I think it's just one of those things like you can make time, right? And clients, you talk to them multiple times usually. It's not just like one interactions, uh, you know, it becomes a consistent relationship. So it's not every time that you have to get into some deep conversations, but over the flow of conversation, you know, you build a rapport, you have, you know, the first two to five minutes might be just pleasantry. So I think there's a way that you could build it in if you really want to. I think I find little ways to remember like my new weird stuff about people. And so I think one of my clients, I came and I was like, how's your father? I know you said he was in the nursing home. And she was like, oh yeah, you know, it's been a few months, but if you kind of take a little note of, of something that's going on and you can follow up and ask about that, I think people really appreciate those little uh, opportunities to really uh, tell you what's going on with them. And so that's one of my little secrets. If I meet someone, I'll write it down on a business card or I'll put it in a little note somewhere and I may follow up with you about that later on. 
I haven't had the experience with like clients, but I have had it with family members, you know, and it's just, you know, making time to speak to your family members while you're, you know, going through, you know, the process and just asking them about certain things that you remember um, was going on at the time you left. Um, and so I found that to be helpful as well. Yeah. You know, at, at a time like this where, you know, there's quarantine and shelter in place and um, we're not uh, socializing as much in person with people, right? Um, I'm curious with your, with your, uh, where you guys work, with your supervisors or bosses before you guys have meetings, are there sort of check-ins? Like, how are they handling this? Yeah, I have weekly check-ins. Um, and I'm also going through pretty much all the partners in my firm and having some kind of introduction check-in meeting as I started a new job. Um, but yeah, weekly check-ins, their Zoom happy hours, uh, you know, anything to kind of try to create, you know, and continue the relationship. It's, it's tough not being face-to-face -face and talking to people, you know, while you're getting water or passing in the halls, uh, but you try to make it work the best way you can. I've done the same thing because I just started a new position as well. So uh, I, I think I was the one who asked for the uh, weekly uh, check-ins via Zoom, and those went well. And then um, I told each of my team members, I'm going to call you individually because I do have an open-door policy, but I'm not going to wait for you to reach out to me. I'm going to reach out to you. And so funny enough, no one reached out to me, even though I offered them that. But when I called them and we started talking, uh, most of the individuals on our team needed something. Maybe it was like they wanted to go to CLE because they weren't sure about some sort of, uh, some area of the practice of dependency. And that's something that I can easily do for them. But they would, I would have never known that had I not taken that initiative as a leader to, to go to them and, and check in with them. And I think that's the power of checking in with your people. Yeah, um, my school has done a great job of keeping up with us and wanting to know how we're doing. Um, we get weekly emails from staff members just want us to check in. Like I got a call yesterday from my contract uh, teacher just want to know like how everything's going, how am I doing? So, um, you know, we definitely have weekly meetings, um, weekly calls and talks with our uh, classmates and or uh, instructors and uh, administration. Nice, nice. Um... You know, for those who uh, do want to educate themselves about what's going on, about racial injustice and uh, systemic racism in society, what do you, do you guys have any suggestions on um, how to do that? And what resources are out there that people can look into? I would say uh, don't, don't stop watching what's going on right now. Um, uh, this is something that, you know, I feel like this is a great learning tool. And, and as uh, um, Donald mentioned earlier, that people want to respond now. And I think that's great because, you know, so this is the time to learn. Keep watching because it's still happening. So I think that's a great tool um, just to keep watching what's happening right now. I mean, just look up Black Lives Matter, uh, Know Your Rights campaign, you know, work with the Men of Color Project. There's so many different outlets out there. Uh, it just takes a quick Google and you can find it. If you if you want to put the work in, the resources are out there for you to put the work in. I think the same thing. Uh, find some portion of it that you're passionate about and learn more about it. And so, like, if you're interested in, like, it always push, like, voting because that's, one of the most important things to come from this. If we don't have leaders in place, just like we're talking about today, if you don't have leadership who understands the importance of uh, tolerance and diversity and inclusion and all those things, then all this is for naught. And that's where voting comes in. So if that's your thing, why don't you uh, help people register to vote? And that's going to help you. It's, uh, when we talk about cognitive dissonance, it helps uh, break that cognitive dissonance because you're actually doing what you believe in. And I think it reinforces the pattern. So find some little thing that can help push forward the cause that you believe in or that you want to learn more about. And I think that's the best way to do it. And also you being involved, like doesn't really mean you have to be the one out there speaking all the time. Cause you know, you know, like everyone has their own skill set. Like you, you know, if you're an advocator, go talk. If you can write, make posters and emails. If you can draw, go draw posters. You know, like you don't, you know, I want people to know that being about the cause it's not all the same thing. And there's different aspects to being with the cause. 
I'm glad that you said that because I, I, I really was torn about that when all this happened. I was like, I want to be on the front lines. And my dad's like, you're in the boot. You can't be on the front lines. So you have to find another way to do it. So I think you hit, hit it on the head, LJ. Everybody has to operate in, in their own uh, passion and, and their own talents. Exactly. So um, curious, how, how do you think our audience can leave here from this webinar um, leading with authenticity and leading with humanity and checking with others um, to see how they're coping, whether it's with COVID or, or with everything that's going on, um, you know, whether it be from with peers or your supervisors or clients or colleagues, what do you guys recommend? I mean, a phone call, a text, an email, anything. I think, but you change the conversation. So many times we'll see somebody and it's like, hey, how you doing? I'm good, you're good, oh, we all good? And then boom, you move on to the next thing. I think it's time to, you know, maybe say that you're a little bit more, you know, than just good. Maybe I'm not good. Maybe I'm feeling this, or maybe I want to learn about the situation that's going on. I think it's time to open up the door and be be more vulnerable and, you know, try to, you know, extend the conversations a little bit more. So I think reaching out, you know, people always love, you know, to know that somebody's thinking about them. So reaching out, trying to connect to them is the first place to start. And I think reaching out and, and also uh, challenging them and making them have the hard conversation to really express themselves, because a lot of people are not going to express themselves just the way it is. So I really think that, you know, I think you show you care by pushing people to have the hard convos um, and, and, and to express, you know, how they really feel. I think um, also in having that, you want to create the environment for them to feel comfortable enough to have those conversations. And so I think that does come with just like going back to the beginning, building those relationships. Uh, I have people who I check in with every day. I have people who I check in with once a month. I have people who I check in with once a week. And I have a list of those people. So sometimes I just cross them off each month. I say, okay, I call my mentor. This is my call. I call, I call my grandmother every day. And certain people I check in with all the time. And I think that's also part of it, staying connected uh, and checking out. And when we talk about it, you have to be intentional about your, um, your efforts. Um, there's actually a question here from the audience. Um, and they want to know, how does intersectionality show up at your work? Um, so how you as a black cis man center black women black trans folks that last sentence a little confusing but yeah so how does intersectionality show up at your work if at all i mean i'm a black woman um <laughs> and uh and usually i'm the only one in the room full of white males uh for all intents and purposes uh we we do very good in our organization with diversity um but I'm the only one, and, and sometimes it's my job to speak up. But also, uh, I really like my leadership because they have hired people who are different. And I mean, we have people who are uh, Jewish, and we, we have people who are Muslim, and they are uh, from Russia, and we have people from all over. And I think um, as we move forward and we talk about intersectionality, um, I like to call people to the table. You say diverse is important to you. Let me see your board of directors. You say diverse is important to you. Let me see what your executive team looks like. You say it's important to you. Does that one token manager you have who's a person of color actually have a voice to do they feel ostracized? Let's really talk about it the way it needs to be talked about. And so that's um, how it shows up for me. Um, I, I try to advocate when it does show up and I try to treat everybody with respect. Exactly. I think you 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 hit it perfectly. I mean, I'm often the only black person in the room or one of a few. So I think how I carry myself and, you know, how I act in the room goes a long way. Uh, but it's also pushing the conversation, knowing, you know, that I shouldn't be the only one. I shouldn't feel in this position. And when I'm here, I sh definitely shouldn't feel uncomfortable. I shouldn't feel two steps back, you know, when I walk into a room. So I think creating some comfort level, you know, where you work and pushing the diversity conversation, pushing the executive leadership, where are all the black partners? That is a huge thing that we are missing. Um, and it's a conversation that needs to be had. And it's just, you know, slowly, you know, easing the conversation in that. I think if sometimes you come from in a place of attack or, you know, anger, it won't necessarily work out, but I think it is a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, for me, I've been a bit spoiled in my experiences because you know i go to a historic black law school right but when i 
go out and intern and when I go out to conferences, I'm typically one of three, you know, who are are, you know, you know, in the rooms. So I definitely think it's it, it's a uh a, a, a combo that needs to be had. Nice, nice. All right, so we have about six minutes left. Um so is there anything else um that uh you would like to uh, any messages that you would like to leave with the audience on this webinar? Any last thoughts? I mean, first, I would just like to say thank you for attending. Um, I think you already saw the title. You might not have known if you, you know, you might be touched or even particularly want to come, or maybe you just came because, you know, it's the opener for the spring. Uh, but thank you for coming. I hope you got something out of this. This is just the conversation starter. Uh, I ask that you just continue to push the ball forward. This is a, a rough time in all of our lives, you know, just dealing with COVID and, you know, everything else that is going on in the world. So I ask that you, you know, be the person that you want to be, be the person for change and continue moving forward. I'll add to it and say that I think that this is a uh, a step in, 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 in having that conversation that, you know, you mentioned earlier. And I think that, um, you know, Again, like like Donald said, thank you for having me. I hope that I've added to some uh, form of your knowledge about anything, if that's possible. <laughs> but um, but but, but uh, thank you for having me. Thank you guys for having me and let me bring bring my unique perspective. And um, I thank everybody who's attended, whether you're an attorney or not. Um, I I've been reminded so many times of. Uh, even though this feels hard, sometimes it feels impossible because it's been going on for so long. Uh, I'm reminded over and over again that we were created for a time such as this. This is our time. So if you are on and you are interested in what's going on and moving forward, you were created for a time such as this. So take your talents and move forward to help. And for my attorneys who are attending, I always leave with, leave with the same message. You know, make sure you operate with integrity and professionalism because you may be the only justice that someone ever knows. And we stand in between justice and injustice every day for people. Thank you, guys. Um, we have three minutes left, but there's one question that just came in. Um, let me see. What would you say to legal employers is a key way to open up additional opportunities for advancement for lawyers of color in their organization? Can you repeat the question? What would you say to legal employers is a key way to open up additional opportunities for advancement for lawyers of color in their organization? Hire. <laughs> uh, I think it, that's the first thing is hire. Look for those candidates. Go to the schools. Where, where are they? Um, so I think it's, it's having an open mindset there. You know, there's a lot of you know, diversity, uh, 1L clerkships, there's, you know, summer uh, internships. And I think, I mean, somewhat it starts there, but there's a lot that fall through the cracks. And sometimes we're only looking at the top of the class. We only want to hire the best of the best. You know, there's very great students and people who will be great lawyers that sometimes fall in the bottom half. You know, law school isn't necessarily for everyone, but that doesn't dictate, you know, the lawyers that they'll be. So I think sometimes we focus on that, you know, top 10% a little bit too much, you know, and we can focus on, you know, a different part of the class. But I think it just, it starts with hiring. I agree, it does start with hiring, but uh, I think the best thing you can do when you have individuals who you bring out to your team is make sure they have a mentor, make sure that they have someone who is genuinely in interested in their uh, forward advancement, who is not intimidated by who they are as a person and, and the skill set that they bring to the table. Also provide them training and transferable skills so that they can grow in their uh, position because the best thing we can do as leaders is give people all the skills and training they need to go and usually those are the ones who stay and um, make our organization the best. Great. Well, on that note, um, I want to thank everyone um, for joining the conversation. Um, I want to Give special thanks to our panelists, Adrianette, Donovan, LJ, um, for taking the time to be a part of this panel, for, for sharing uh, your thoughts and furthering the discussion on this important topic of vulnerability as a leadership strength. Um, and I hope that everyone uh, attending this webinar was able to um, 
learn something and incorporate some of the lessons into your personal lives, right? The importance of being authentic, um, the importance of, of showing your humanity and being vulnerable. And that when you do that, um, that'll make you a great leader, right? But also bring um, positivity, you know, into your, into your work and personal life. So, um, and we all know that we need that now more than ever. So um, thank you everyone uh, for attending the webinar and have a great rest of the week.